call to order the regular planning commission meeting for Thursday, August 8th. Can we have a roll call? Cheryl Badgett. Here. Don McBride. Absent. Chris Bryant. Here. Joe Chapman. Present. And that's three, and that's enough for a quorum. All right. Item number two is public comments. Um, generally, in the past, these public comments are for items that are not on the agenda. So if anyone has any public comments unrelated to the agenda items, you are free to speak now. None? Okay, then item number three is nomination and election of a chair. Um, we have not discussed this chairmanship. Um, I'd like to at this time just acknowledge the loss of our chairman, Vern Ogburn who was a great asset to this community, and I enjoyed serving as his vice chair, and uh, we will all miss his uh, dedication to our community. Um, I currently serve as the chairman of the HP uh, Historic Preservation, so I would like to remove my name for consideration as chairman of the Planning Commission. And I'd like to, can the chair nominate someone? Yes. I'd like to nominate Chris Bryant. Surprise, surprise. I, I would respectfully decline in favor of nominating uh, Ms. Cheryl Padgett. <laughs> I know she's our currently newest <laughs> member of the commission, but I a senior men, too, but member of her, city leadership. First meeting. So. Is this punishment? <laughs> yeah. but, but, but you are a former planning commissioner. That's true. Yes, and council. And council. if you would accept, I would second it. <laughs> is that a, is that you a made the motion? proposal. No, you were going to make. Oh, oh I make we'll the motion. Have, okay, I remove Cheryl. my motion. I move that we accept uh, Cheryl Paget as the chair of the planning commission. You all may be in for a shock. What's that? I Joe, you had a... you had second that, right, Joe? I will. I will second. Okay. All right, <laughs> Chris Bryant. Yes. Joe Chapel. Uh, yes. Cheryl Paget. Do I have to vote? No, but you'd still, I don't think it really matters at this point. Okay. <laughs> All you have to do is just keep everybody in order. Yeah. You know. Oh, thank you, Chris. She's, thank a, you. she's a woman of few words, but they're always wise. Okay. So, nomination, election of a vice chair. Would you do that? It's not too many of us left. Huh? Uh, There's not too many of us left, so I would accept the vice okay, chair. Okay, then I nominate Chris Bryant for vice chair. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. And then you will second. And I second. Okay. Oh, okay. Joe Chapel. Yes. Cheryl Paget. Yes. Chris Bryant. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So now does she can, conduct the meeting? Say, now we can hand the reins over to Cheryl. Yay. Yes. <laughs> I haven't studied my Robert's rules. I feel better we'll already. Keep you, we'll keep you You'll be fine. Okay, bear with me, please. Um, since we've completed one, two, three, and four, yes, uh, we need approval of the previous minutes from June thirteenth, twenty nineteen. And uh, I wasn't here, so can we even I vote on that? Wasn't here either. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. We, because we don't have members okay. here. You're right. We'll just table that table to the that. next meeting. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, number six. Do you normally read this out? Yes. Okay. Yes, and then I'll follow up with the rest. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, PC application number 19-006. Discussion and possible action on a request to rezone 12 acres of property located in the northwest quarter of the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter of section six. Township 15 North Range 2 West, south of Lakewood Drive, northwest of Chris Madsen Road, from R1, which is single family residential, to R5, planned unit development, for a 12 unit bed and breakfast and a group reception center not to exceed events of more than 60 people. So, do we have a staff report on that? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, there, and, and this is for the sake of the public as well, because there was uh, this item was to be heard at the previous uh, planning commission meeting in which we did not have a quorum. 
Uh, the original yeah, sorry, request was R1 to R2, which is multifamily. Uh, be after the last meeting, even though it wasn't held, there was some discussion among the applicant as well as residents in that uh, regarding this. And so I, in essence, I went back because the, the consensus was is if there was a way to tie them to what they want to do, because going to an R2 rezone, you cannot condition it, you cannot hold any conditions, so it's kind of an open-ended. And I know that was a concern. Uh, when I went back, I reviewed our R5, which is our plan development ordinance. And even though it talks more of large communities type of, of an aspect, the elements for a typical plan development were there in terms of the process, in terms of what would transpire. And so what that means for tonight's meeting is it would be approved with a specific development plan and possible conditions that could be tied to that approval. So uh, down the road, if it were approved, not only by the planning commission, but the council, there would be certainty there as to what could what would transpire, the limitations of what would transpire, and if any of that were to change, it would have to go through the exact process it's going through today. So as was explained in the uh, introduction, it is going from R1 single family to R5 plan development with the development plan that would be for a 12 unit bed and breakfast as well as the ability to hold uh, events. In our code, it is defined as a, I have to look myself, as a group reception center, which basically means they can hold events for people, weddings and that type of thing. However, the limitation would be no more than 60 people. Uh, that was roughly the number of people that they would have anyway if all of their units were to be at, at uh, capacity. In that, so that's kind of where that number was derived. Obviously, that number can change either way, however, uh, would be decided. Uh, just some other background in that. The comprehensive plan does have this area as a, um, as, uh, let me see, uh, conservation development. In our code, it doesn't tell a lot. The comp plan doesn't tell a lot of how that should be developed, but it does dictate or say that it should be basically no more than two uh, units per acre, which if they're doing uh, a 12 acre with uh, 12 units, it obviously isn't going to exceed the densities that set forth within our, our comp plan. Uh, and I believe that's about it. That, that's the rest of it. At this point, uh, I would open it to the commission for any questions from staff. And then, as you can see, we have people here that would like to uh, give their comments or their feedback on this particular item. Okay. Any comments from the commission? Any questions? Not yet. Yeah, I think I would like to hear from the applicant and any others who are signed up to speak. Okay. First, before I make my okay. comments and questions. The applicant, uh, come to the podium and give us your name and your address, please. Okay. I printed these out for you guys, um, just to have a visual aid. Okay. Thank you. I'll read that too, just to kind of explain. Thank you. My name is Alicia Hinn. And my address, is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. 10125 Mills Paw Way. I'm not 100% sure of the address of this property, however. Yeah, it doesn't technically have, have one yet. <laughs> um, okay, so I wrote something. I'm a little bit better that way. But I'll read this that you guys have. Our main focus at the point is to create a home away from home where our guests can feel comfortable and protected from the chaos of daily life. A space filled with laughter where you want to bring your family to learn about nature and about community. Our goal is to create a space where cell phones and distractions are left behind and the pastime of talking to one another is revived. We would like to be able to hold small weddings, retreats and gatherings of up to 50 to 60 people. The plan for this land is not to develop it. Instead, we only wanna clean things up and enhance the beauty that's already there. We're proposing 12 thoughtfully curated A-frame inspired cabins with bathrooms and kitchenettes, an indoor outdoor patio area for community gatherings, and a maintenance building in similar style to the cab to the cabin architecture. 
Our home will be on site on the adjacent proposed 10 acres to oversee the activities of all the guests at all times. This will be a way of life for us and our family. Guthrie is a city unlike any other in Oklahoma and our vision is to bring life to this land where people are able to experience the community that exists in this charming town. And then following that, and I can pass these around for you guys too. Following that, there's some inspirational images so you can kind of get an idea architecture-wise, look-wise, the feel of everything, and then the um, map on the very back. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, um, gentlemen, do you have any questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, and if you have, yeah, come up to the podium if you have any comments, questions. And who would this question be for, Ms. Hen? Uh, actually, for the commission. Okay. Uh, this is a rezoning. Uh, your yes. your okay. name and address. Larry Britton, uh, six one one five Southwest Eighteenth. Thank you. I'm familiar with the land. I mow that corner. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> just to keep it cleaned up. Uh, okay, if if we pass this and the business fails, you know, because well, from what you said, we're going to R five. Correct. Which precludes multiple dwellings or. Any of that that is correct. It would be tied to this development plan, which then could if approved could not exceed 12 units Okay, now in a year or so down the road. And I really hope to success. Okay <laughs> But if a year or so down the road It doesn't work people don't want to walk in nature when all that Are they going to be able to just rent these out? I mean, not necessarily because it will be tied to the use as well. So it would still have to function as a bed and breakfast type use. It couldn't go to a true, if you want to say full time residence, apartments type situation in that. So if, if it were to, let's say, even if they sold the property, this development plan and any conditions associated with it would be tied to the land. And so even if they sold it, somebody else comes in, they would have to remain doing the exact same thing. If they want to change it, it would have to go through a similar process that we're going through now, even if it's changing, you know, portions of the development plan okay. and that. So, so it would have to be zoned again. It, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily have to be else. zoned, but yeah, the development plan or whatever that changes would have to be approved. It would likely probably still stay under an R5 or something like that. It could possibly go some other way. But the important thing is, is that there would have to be a process and to, and right. to do that. Well, I, what I'm seeing is right now it's R1, so it's that single correct. family dwelling yep. correct. on on a piece of one property. dwelling. Yeah, even as it sits now, it's actually 22 total acres. They're looking to split it into 12 and 10. The 10 acre is just going to have a single family residence. The 12 acre that we're talking about tonight is going to have the bed and breakfast. But if it were not approved, and even and if they did still went through with the lot split, it would only be one uh, dwelling unit per parcel whether it's 12 acres or 6,000 square feet. And it wouldn't be feasible to, I mean, if they're gonna put a cabin on each acre, you could sell acre lots with cabins. Well, yeah, I mean, theoretically, you can go through a subdivision process, yeah, but yeah. I mean, it could be, even as it sits in R1, somebody could come in and do a subdivision and split up that parcel into a number of single family residences that would exceed the number of units they're looking at. But again, that would be through a subdivision process. All right. I don't know if we got any of these pictures on camera, if, if um, Aaron can get a picture of this. So people, people watching can see this, the concept. Thank you. Anybody okay. else? Abe, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry, Lynn, next. <laughs> name and address, please. Well, my name is Abe Gossampur. I live at 6805 South Coltrane. I uh, have been uh, living in there almost in October uh, 20 years. And this is a picture of my deers in my backyard, and I appreciate you offering nature, Steve. We already have the nature, so we don't need no artificial nature. 
this property uh, has, uh, as you have mentioned in there, uh, that is contained about approximately 25 acres. My question is, if you change this to anything, what prevents you the next time that you cannot change it, change the remaining of the property? And by this way, the family owns approximately 260 acres in that area. I mean, we want to leave in our peace. We have decided to, that I'm not going to move anymore. I'll probably come for you to get a cemetery lot so I can even just be buried over there. I don't want to move. You need a PUD for that, by the way. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I need to come up here before you. And if you look at the map in here, the, this is the map of that area. Mm -hmm. If you look at this in here, there's no commercial, no single uh, devils, uh, R5s or R2s within miles. Uh, this is right in the Guthrie Lake. And the uphill property there, and having 12 pieces of property, probably in one place, and 60 people, all this stuff, there is no city sewage. There is no, uh, all of those confinement, uh, just contaminations and stuff is going to be draining in the Guthrie Lake because the creek is right there. So it's really not a good idea. And I appreciate you. We, we, we like where we are. I don't want no changes. And if I feel like, if you all change anything, I feel like we're really violating our rights. Um, may I get, uh, I need to ask you a question, yes, Abe, to, to make sure I have it straight. You're asking if it's R1 now and it's changed to R5 and this doesn't complete or doesn't stay, what can it be first changed all, to then? First, yeah, first of all, okay. the R1, we'd like to remain as an R1. Right. And based on the conversation and the city ordinance, the bed and breakfast can be put in an R1 subject to the uh, uh, special use. Am I correct, Dan? Yes. So why do we have to rezone it? Because the minute you rezone it, then there's out of your control. If the next time you deny the next guy, you'd be subject to the lawsuit. We don't want to open the door. Right. I would it, like to defer uh, to you uh, on yeah, that. I can answer that. <laughs> it has to do with separate units. Uh, you're right. If you have one home, if you want to say, in, in one structure, and you want to use it as a bed and breakfast in the R1, you go through the special use permit right. process to get it approved. Right. In this case, since they have individual units, you can't, it exceeds the one unit or one well, structure per the R1. I understand. So they, yeah, but so that's why they're here, going. This is the map that this property is 25 acres, that the 16 acres of it, uh, 12 acres of it is, is a subject to this. It's all been platted. They got content that they contains lots, and it's not something that is just an open, wide that the 12 acres that you go ahead and give them a blank check, and they can do what the heck they want to do. This is platted already, so why don't they apply for each lot that they already have? It's yeah, it's not platted. That might be. This is already here. It's been advertised. You have it. This is they. They probably did not show you, but this has already been platted. That we might. Serve it. That may have been an idea that the owners had, but it hasn't been approved, nor has it been platted as such. This so that might have been something that they were looking to do at one time. I'm not sure, but they I can tell you. Mm -hmm. They just sold the lot nine there on, on February of this year. What it, do you mean they platted it? They sold lot nine. They went through a lot split yeah. process in which created a 3.3 acre lot. They're looking at taking 22 acres and splitting it in two. Yeah. I'm, well, yeah, and all I'm saying personal, is that my has personal a, point yeah. is I'm sure everybody has a right to talk about, you know, they themselves. I have moved many times, semi-retired. I don't want to move. I'm sitting up here, peace and quiet. You're talking a bed and breakfast, my friend. Bed and breakfast is just a fancy name for hotels and motels so they can charge more. That's all it is. The kids and children and the grandchildren are riding their bicycle, walking their dogs. And we don't know who the heck is going to be there. We don't know who's going to be staying in there. We don't need it. We don't need to rezone it. We just appreciate it. Just leave it the way it is. Thank you. Thank you, Abe. I have a question for staff. Um, yes. Uh, could you address the concern about sewer runoff and other infrastructure? What, what kinds of city infrastructure is already there? I believe it's in Lakewood Road. To be honest with you offhand, I don't know. But I can tell you that uh, I think 
yeah, if I remember right, the water sewer is close enough to where they would have to tie into that. And even drainage and other things uh, are... No water and sewage. There's okay, no there may not be. Then they would have a septic yeah, system. But, but the development is going to be bound by the codes that are in place, building codes. And again, if they don't have the water sewer, they'll have a septic system that's permitted and uh, all of those. So it's not going to go on. Just like everyone else. Yeah, would. just like anybody right. else. Yeah. Lynn, I think you wanted to speak. My name is Lynn Billado. I live at uh, 215 South 2nd. I always have to remind myself where I live because we office at 212 East 2nd in Edmond. So <laughs> we get those mixed up. But we are 215 South 2nd Street. My first question to the commission, um, do I need to be the landowner to apply for a zone change? Because High Point's not the landowner or the point, whatever that organization is. And I just want the, the council to be aware or the commission be aware, um, this property is still tied up in a probate proceeding. This property is owned by the estate, uh, the estate of Julia Taylor. And the personal representative that I believe filed the initial application does not have permission from the court to do this. I represent one of the beneficiaries in that estate. I've entered an appearance in the case. It's a civil matter. I spoke with her attorney, Tim Green, at 415 today, who told me, that she was told to withdraw this application. So I don't even know that anybody has standing to be making this application today. I can guarantee you, I do know this for a fact, she does not have permission from the court to do this. She's not applied to the court for permission, and the other beneficiary of the estate that would have to sign off on this has not signed off on it. Thank and you. so I'd want you to be aware that this, uh, I don't think that uh, the point, whoever's doing the application, anybody other than the personal representative, even has standing. Thank you, Lynn. You and bet. I will refer to you again. I, yeah, I can say that the, I can say that the application did have a ownership that has, uh, if you want to say title. I don't know if it has complete title. There could be some legalities in there. I don't know with certainty, but what came with a ownership or partial ownership signature on the application. Now the applicant who is actually um, bringing forth that is looking to buy the property and I believe this is a condition of the contract that they have with the owner that if it's approved then they're going to buy the property and if not they you may not. So the one that's making the application or once the um, rezone is not the owner. Yeah. However, there was ownership that signed an application to bring this forward. Okay. But, um, but again, I'm not going to argue with, with the legalities because yeah. I'm not the lawyer in it and, and Mr. Billado and that, if they have other information, all I can say is if the commission has concerns that there is legal issues that could come up or be involved, I would just suggest that it get tabled. Okay. Um, Excuse well, me. then I, 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 I want to miss. Did anybody have any questions for me? I'd be glad to answer your mm -hmm. questions. Um, just a second, okay. 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 Oh. Would somebody make a motion? Could I interject before you guys do make a motion? Just to let you know, I do represent the party that uh, is trying to sell the property, and this is of a larger piece of tract. The lot nine that. Um, uh, <laughs> Abe spoke about was a previous lot split of this same acreage. So we have already went through this process and sold a piece of this property. Um, and so this is just another piece that that is continuing to sell. So it was a larger tract. We've already sold a piece. Now we're trying to sell this piece. James, uh, excuse me, for the record, do you mind stating sure, your name? Sure, sorry. James please. Long. I live at 512 East Washington Thank Avenue. You. And so this is just a continuation of the, the breakdown of that larger tract. So one piece has been sold. We're looking to sell this one. It is contingent upon being approved for this use um, with, the, with the current buyer. Um, Tim Green is the, um, is the attorney that was, is representing um, the seller, so I don't. No disrespect to any side, but um, as the chair of this commission, I'm a little concerned about agreeing to do something without full legal process being done and having the correct signatures and information necessary in order for it to legally be correct. Um, could someone on the commission please speak 
your yeah. I'll say you, also you know. just to when we did the not lot split, we got uh, pushed back because of a similar uh, situation where a sibling did not agree, so it got pushed back, and then inevitably we did get granted the lot split, and we were able to sell. So. I'm yeah. sure. I guess and, and there's personalities be, in place here. Obviously, right. two siblings aren't getting along, but I don't know that that's fair to the prospective buyer either. Right. If we don't, I mean, obviously, it can't sell if we don't have uh, legal right to or approval to sell it. Um, but if you guys can't make a decision, then that obviously then just prolongs that process again if we have to go back and prove what we've already proved before. I think it would be nice if you guys could have a resolution, and then if they can't sell it, they can't sell it. But I don't think that would be the case. But it's my understanding that the court hasn't signed off on that. Is that correct? Well, okay. All the, I mean, title work is, is complete and we're, we're, we're ready. I mean, we, like I said, we've already sold one parcel. Right. We're just waiting to sell another piece of it. But so, I mean. Okay. Yeah. And I'll just like real her. quick, just again, just simply for the record, just providing information, uh, I would confirm what Mr. Long had stated that there was a previous lot split mm -hmm. and it actually had to go to the city council because there was right of way dedications that were required mm -hmm. and that did go to the council and to get, did get approved and sold. And again, that's just to kind of confirm mm -hmm. even from the city standpoint, the uh, point of record. Thank you. So if they, I mean, it's it sold under the same ownership, the same everything that we currently have, that transaction did take place. It did get to sell. And what date was that? Do you remember just offhand? February. February? February. Earlier this year. I was going to say okay. it was Spring. earlier this year. I yeah. don't remember the council okay. date. I was going to say January, but it could have been February. Okay, that's February of 2019. Stay on hold. Lynn, could, could you address some of those concerns, please? Certainly, there's two ways you can sell a piece of property while the probate is pending. One is to actually file a motion with the court, have a big hearing, everybody fights and everything comes out. The second way is what's called a 239 application. So under section 239 of the probate code, you file an application. If all of the beneficiaries, all of the heirs sign off on that, mm -hmm. then the, it can be sold without any further order of the court. 239 sales have happened on two pieces of property in that estate. So they were done by agreement. My client signed off on both of those long before they ever went to sale. So if there was a holdup in the sale, it wasn't because he hadn't yet given his permission. He gave his permission before they even started the lot split. There's been no 239 application on this one because my client's made it clear he's not willing for this piece of property to be sold. So it has nothing to do with whether a piece of property has been sold previously out of this estate. That's, it it actually, absolutely has been, but it was with my client's permission. My client's not given permission on this. Um, and, and like I said, there's not even been an application filed with the court I don't think that the personal representative even has standing to request a lot split without going through the probate court first. She doesn't even have the authority to do that. I also, and I do not know, I'm new to the city of Guthrie, so I'm not sure on the procedural things, but I question the propriety of Mr. Long, a council member, addressing this council or this commission on something that's then going to go to the council. So I'm not sure that Mr. Long, and if he does have the right to be here, I'm fine with that. I just would like somebody to check and see if he even has the right to address this commission on those matters. Unfortunately, our city attorney is not here this okay. evening. Okay. Yes. And Sorry. so it's the I, same thing. So, I and was, I'm not throwing a fit, right. and that's why I didn't no, jump I up know. and interrupt him. No, Everybody gets their day. I know. Um, I'm just questioning the propriety just, of that. I, I We've never it. needed the attorney before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm well, he's on retainer, right? Two attorneys. Have Where's that retainer when we need it? Asking this question of you. Okay. Uh, but out, because I'd need to learn. Absolutely. Um, just in your opinion, would there be any ramifications to the city of Guthrie, your city council, our commission, if we do approve it without any of this information being um, taken care of, or, or should we just table it until we have the satisfactory signed documents? I believe my client will be deprived of due process because my client is precluded from coming in here because he's on the city council. Okay. And I believe he's deprived of due process. If you rezone this, something that he is an heir, it is in that estate, 
he doesn't have the opportunity to be heard. He did, and, and so I think that would be a violation of his due process, right? Okay. Um, thank you, Lynn, very much. And, is, is, and if I can add, much yes. like you, Madam Chair, I'm not a lawyer. And so, you know, the legalities of it, of all that was stated, I don't know. Uh, in that, uh, you know, the, the Planning Commission is a recommendation body. So mm -hmm. what happens tonight is not going to be a final say. It goes to the City Council for a final, if you want to say approval, regardless, even if the commission were to deny it tonight, it still goes to the council and it could be approved or even if tonight we said, so I was just say, just laying that out there, but when it comes to the legalities, I'm like you, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know. And if we chose to table it tonight with the recommendation that the city council uh, check to make sure well it wouldn't be the well, yeah i guess it wouldn't be that. the city council i mean we as staff me myself would get in touch with the both parties mm -hmm. and you know find out and probably get our city attorney involved in it okay. to find out what's going on and make sure that everything is on the up and up and and straight i, would I guess like, i would like to make sure yeah, that, yeah that would be my question is how can we prevent this from happening going forward what information do we need to know before it's on the agenda so that we save, yeah. a, save a few more headaches for everyone. Oh, right. Like I said, we'd just have to go back. I would get with our city attorney and they would, he would get with the respective attorneys of probably both parties and find out exactly what's going on. And through that, there would be a determination that's made or at least a plan of action to where we could get to the application going forward, if it could ever go forward. Yes, sir. Name and address. I, my name is Ed Bugby. Mm -hmm. I'm at 408 Kinswick Court in Edmond, Oklahoma. I'm the husband of uh, the young lady, Jan Taylor mm -hmm. Bugby, mm -hmm. uh, who is the uh, executor of the estate. Uh, just a point of order here. There's only one piece of property that's actually under probate rule, which is what we refer to as the white place, which is an 80-acre piece of property that... Uh, it's not too far from there, but it's a little ways from there. Um, that is under probate. The rest of the properties are not under probate. Uh, there was a sign <clears throat> prior to you being the attorney. Uh, there was a court document that was agreed to by the former attorney uh, and Tim Green and both parties that agreed that, this, that, these, that these properties would be sold. It's a matter of record in the court. It is not under probate, uh, and that's why we were able to sell, the family was able to sell the other parcel of land. Um, there's no probate here, and I just wanted to make sure I brought that up. Thank you. I make a motion that we table this until staff has a chance to, because, you know, to, there's no way that we can decide what is in probate and what isn't in probate. We've got two different stories here. I would, Do I have a second? I would second, and, and second like that to. motion. I have a proposal and a second. Right, I was just going to say, and just to reiterate, that it would be a motion to, yeah, table until table. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. research, I guess, or information is found regarding the legal issue. And discussion with our city attorney. Yeah, okay. okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, okay, Joe Chapel. Yes. Cheryl Padgett? Yes. Chris Bryant? Yes. All right, that passes 3-0. Thank you all very much for being here and uh, talking with us, and we will have it on a future agenda. And if you, well, if, if they were only here for that, they're certainly welcome to leave. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyone that had another, anything else, you're welcome to stay. We'll discuss that. <clears throat> prior, prior to the next agenda item, I was wondering if, it would make sense to have Councilman Long present uh, what he has because I think it has Before. some relevancy to uh, item if seven. We could stop him out there and bring him back. Yeah, and the same thing, it, you know, as you guys, as the commission, can make a, a basically a decision or a motion mm -hmm. to move the agenda item up. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Yep. okay. So I would like to move that that agenda item eight uh, be moved up to item seven 
and item seven would become item eight. I don't know how you want to word that. We can just yeah. switch those around. Point of order. Just basically switch them. Okay. You're right. We're going to switch uh, item eight to take the place of seven, and seven will be then eight. Yeah. And Councilman James, Long, we would like you to present before the oh, next agenda. If I could have, no, a, have who was the second? I'm sorry. We have to it vote. Was, uh, Chris was the second. <coughs> oh, no, he made uh, the motion, right? No, I was second. Oh, I'm sorry. Joe sorry. seconded. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. Okay. Sure. Okay, so Joe Chapel. Yes. Yeah. You, you added yes. Chris? Yes. Yes. And Cheryl? Yes. Okay, so 3 0, and we've right. got it. Just making a matter of record. Right. <laughs> Are you good to go, Mr. Long? Or? I am. Okay. Uh, he's, Aaron had to move all the heavy equipment over to. Yeah, I know for the retreat, so, so I know he's that he's yeah. going to listen to me say next when we uh, start this. So. Okay, so what I'm proposing to you this evening is, is regards to design guidelines. Uh, when we talk about uh, commercial space uh, being built uh, within uh, Guthrie uh, proper as a whole, not necessarily just within our, our downtown district. Um, one of the things that, uh, next if you will, one of the things that makes uh, Guthrie unique is, is our architecture, obviously, within our central business district. I think that that's what uh, brings a lot of people uh, to town that are interested in Guthrie and what we have to offer. Next, if you talk about um, preservation, which uh, Guthrie obviously is a town that has um, really based our identity on um, Preservation says that this and a lot of what I'm taking uh, or stating here is coming out of our um, economic uh, or our, our long-term range plan that was done in like 2002, Two. I believe. Yep. Yeah, and it says the urbanism of the town center and the restoration of the vitality that distinguished Guthrie in its early history make the community special for residents and unforgettable to visitors. Next. And so one of the things that we unfortunately have done uh, over the years is tear down a lot of that history. It's unfortunate that we've lost so many of our buildings due to just a lack of understanding of our history, uh, ignorance, or just making way uh, for the modern way. And if you look at what we've got, the, the previous slide was the Ion Hotel, uh, and you see now that it uh, is just a vacant lot. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see our original city hall in a 1955. We didn't understand the importance of the, the folk art design and architecture. And then we built uh, the very modern thing, black and white picture that you see. And then in 1996, we had regrets. And then in 2019, I'm afraid that we've, uh, and so in 96, we built uh, the new current building that we're in now. And it almost seems as if we've forgotten how important our red bricks are to our identity yet again. And so, as we have over the years, you see the um, bathhouse was torn down, and we have a beautiful parking lot. And then you see that the opera house was torn down, and we have a beautiful parking lot. And then, when we talk about green space, um, we've got the wonderful buildings that were across the street from the uh, uh, city hall here. And now we do have the, uh, although it is very pretty, it's the apothecary gardens, but it, it doesn't stand uh, to compare to the, the beautiful building that was there before. And then you also see the uh, old original uh, Masonic uh, Scottish Rite that is now also uh, just green space here in town. Um, next slide. So just moving forward, downtown Guthrie should continue to develop uh, as a unique a re a regional mixed use district combining traditional retail office and civic uses with significant quality features. And not only just the downtown when you're talking about the central business the district, I think we need to talk about the entire um, commercial zoning uh, of Guthrie. So downtown Guthrie is renowned regionally and even uh, nationally for its uh, rich mixed uses, architectural forms, and civic activity in the center focus and an image center of the whole city. Guthrie's previous downtown revitalization programs is an eloquent testimony to the power of doing things right. The district maintains strong standards uh, reinforced by local preservation ordinances and its status as the national historic uh, landmark district. Guthrie should continue to upgrade and redevelop, uh, redevelop uh, deteriorated buildings throughout our downtown district and as we build forward. Next. So these are some buildings that um, we have that have been built when we talk about what, sh what I feel should be built. Um, we've got um, 1989, that's the Guthrie Upper Elementary School. It's a red brick building. Um, 
that I would say is complementary of, of our design. 1986, we had Dairy Queen build a building, uh, and it's, uh, I would say, very complementary of our design. We've got um, on the lower corner there, uh, built in 83, uh, the, it was the Best Western, but it was also a, a two-story uh, brick uh, hotel that was purchased, or not purchased, that was built. It's since been uh, stuccoed over, but it, but it is originally brill, uh, built as a brick building. Next slide, Aaron. And then in 2002, uh, we see that the Big O Tires had built uh, a nice sandstone and brick building. Uh, in 2000, we see where Gus's Liquor uh, built his uh, small plex there with Keller Williams in there as well. Very complimentary of the downtown district. 2006, uh, the health department built a new structure. Very complimentary. As well as 2009, the city of Guthrie built a water treatment plant that is also very complimentary. But then we have some buildings that were built um, and are proposed to be built that are, are not complimentary at all, in my opinion. If you look at uh, the Express Wellness Urgent Care, uh, it looks like it's primarily EFAS with just a brick corner, maybe has some stone uh, a little way up the bottom, um, but it's got um, uh, primarily the, the EFAS look uh, that I don't think is complimentary. And then in 2003, you have the little strip mall that was built up by uh, Industrial and Division, and as you're coming into town, you see a, a metal building back that isn't complimentary. In 2017, you have um, the Goodwill building, and it wouldn't have taken much, in my opinion, to get that completely uh, complimentary. Uh, they did well on the, the front side there, but then you see the back and the other sides, they just did, did that complete in, in EFIS, and it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't complement our, our downtown district at all. So we have an obligation to our community to grow with the intent to ensure uh, we are good stewards of our community. So we talk about these are the current commercial building appearance standards. So uh, the way they're written um, so can obviously be taken out of um, uh, interpreted many different ways. So I guess what I'm saying is we need to be a little bit more uh, stricter on the terminology that we utilize in order to ensure that the buildings um, are more complementary of what Guthrie's identity uh, should be and, and not allowing uh, metal buildings to be built within our, in our central, in our, well, in our business district. Primarily in our, there's obviously a place for metal buildings, industrial parks, things of that nature. But I would say uh, the main corridors coming to town, such as uh, Highway 33, uh, broad, uh, Broadway um, Division, and uh, obviously the, the central business district uh, as well. But if we've got industrial parks, um, obviously I think metal is, is good there. Uh, you can go to the next slide. This, uh, I'm not going to go through that. You guys can see what our current standards, standards are. I'm not going to necessarily read that to you, but I, th I think we just need to make sure that we're evaluating it. Next slide. Uh, the only thing I want to say out of this is, is highlighted there on the bottom. It says, these unique assets uh, can lead to a resurgence of growth in Guthrie if properly managed and marketed. Next slide. I think that um, contemporary urban development has created uh, monotony in the environment that tends to blur the special qualities of distinctive places within Guthrie itself. Uh, the commercial strip development of the South Division Corridor illustrates this tendency to pave over our special qualities, although uh, such unusual features as Mineral Wells Park and their waterworks continue to assert the town's individuality. Guthrie's future lies in maintaining its special qualities. Um, Guthrie, again, should offer excellent options, but Guthrie must resist the powerful forces of sameness. Uh, there are other places that this kind of, uh, for this kind of development. Instead, this community should remain as special as it has been uh, from the early years. Uh, next. So here's some additional pictures. Now, these obviously are not in Guthrie. These are in the community just to the south. These are all more current buildings as well that have been built over the last decade. Um, in fact, the top two are a brand new development that's going in at um, Bryant and 33rd. It's um, brick and stucco buildings that are, would be very complementary to what we already have. Then you have the uh, Market Depot in the bottom corner there that's at uh, 33rd and Broadway. And then you have uh, the sandstone and brick building of the Bank of Oklahoma building at 15th and, uh, and Bryant as well. And then on the next slide, you see uh, Spring Creek Plaza there is also something that would be very complimentary to what we already have in our downtown district. And um, I'm just trying to share with you the importance of what things, uh, what 
we want our town to look like, what the identity is, and I think we try to ensure that we are a community that um, resembles the turn of the century, uh, 1900 to 1920. And I think um, that as we are continuing to grow as a community, and I hope that we do continue to grow, but that we grow planned and not just grow with whatever someone is willing to build. Thank you, James. Yep. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Thanks again. Okay. I have, I have a question. Oh, I was just going to say, go, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Oh. I was just going to say, just as part of the uh, discussion on that, staff is, you know, aware of, of some of the, I guess, concerns, issues in that, and even on my radar once I got here was to look at build, bringing back the building design standards, both on the residential side as well as the commercial side. Uh, obviously, there is, you know, more, I guess, community and, and even at the council level, uh, I guess, a desire to probably look at that as well. So probably in the near future, I'm hoping maybe even this fall to start that process to bring back. Obviously, it would be at the commission level and we would kind of hash things out probably looking at different workshops and what not to do, and then eventually a recommendation, and then of course that would go to the uh, city council for their review and final approval with stuff. But uh, I just wanted to make a note of that, that you know, staff is also considering and, and looking at uh, bringing that issue forward for further discussion, especially with the public involved. Thank you. Yeah, my question was just about the timeline of the process if we initiated that. Yeah, yeah, because, and, and again, I, you know, I, I would basically get a timeline, but I'm hoping to maybe start in the October, November timeframe, somewhere over in that area, and you'd have to kind of see, but again, it would be looking at probably, obviously, at least one workshop, maybe more, at the uh, commission, with the commission, and then ultimately a, a, a formal approval or, or uh, recommendation uh, by the commission and then to the council. So, okay. Thank you. Sounds good. We have a couple of more agenda items, but great presentation, by the way. Yeah. Well, yes. Thank you. But since I was just duly elected this evening, I probably didn't follow protocol. I do want to ask if there are any other questions that the audience would like to ask or some statements they would like to make in lieu of the fact that I did not properly ask that at the time that we were in discussion. So at this time, if there's anyone else that has something they would like to address the council, um, not the council, I'm sorry, the commission, <laughs> um, please do so at this time. Is, is this about items that are on the agenda tonight? Um, did you sign up to speak before about no, anything? But I, I think you're here for item nine, right? I don't know. I the the 300 foot what? Yes, that's okay, the Okay, we haven't one. come to that yeah, yet. it's coming up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, sir. Well, we actually came to talk about item six, but we didn't realize there was a sign-up sheet. And my understanding is this is going to be moved out to next month's meeting? Is well, we aren't uh, sure when. Yeah, we're not sure. Uh, there will be, again, due to the uncertainty of when it will be, there'll be notification sent out again when a specific uh, planning commission hearing date is set. So I don't want to say it's going to be next month because we may not have the issues taken care of at that time. So like I said, all I can say is that there will be new notifications sent out as well as advertisements in the paper for when that date is determined. And I may have overlooked it in the notification, but I can't remember there being anything about sign-up sheet too far. No, you don't. Yeah, and I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Sure. I was yeah. going to say, any time yeah. there is a, um, agenda item. an agenda item or, or a meeting with an agenda, there will always be a sheet outside the door for you to sign so that you make sure you have permission to speak. So anytime that happens, you're welcome to sign up and then you'll be heard. And are you, do you live out there in that area? Yes. Okay. Right back in there. Really? But we, we have questions on that. Um, is, would it be appropriate to let them speak? Now and I mean, if you have just general on. questions, you can just talk to me either after the meeting or give me a call. I'd be more than happy to talk and answer any questions. Okay. And that if, if there's just generalized questions. Okay, and we've talked yeah, I think we have. And, and again, if you still have questions and you want to wait around, I'll be happy to talk to you after the meeting. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I apologize for my um, lack of protocol. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Then I guess we'll go to uh, number seven. Which actually it's number eight now. because we. Oh, oh, that's right, they've been flipped. Number seven is number eight. Yes. So number, number eight reads as follows. PC application number 19-007, which is discussion and possible action on a request for determination of appropriateness of exterior building materials as outlined in Article 22, Section 4-422G for the proposed Meridian Technology Building located at 3025 South Division and discussion and possible action on request, request for a modification to landscape standards in Article 1, Section 4-11, <coughs> Item 10, the planting of beds from biodegradable mulch to river rock. Staff? Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, yeah, as you in, as you indicated in the introduction, there's a couple issues here. One is with the building exterior, the other is with the landscaping. And I guess for general introduction, this is for the new Meridian uh, Technology Building that's proposed on uh, South Division at 3025 South Division. Uh, it'll be just south of the Mercy uh, Clinic there. But uh, Staff, you know, there's a, a staff level review where we look at the elevations and, and, you know, make sure that they conform to our current design standards. There comes a time where we don't feel that it maybe meets the code or there could be some question. So it's, it's going to be my practice to where if those issues come up, rather than just doing some assumptions or, or saying no altogether, is to move it to this level for the Planning Commission, uh, for you guys to look it over and, you know, make some, uh, I guess, make a decision or, or clarifications. In the, in the um, regards of the landscaping, our ordinance specifically says that if somebody wants to propose any changes to it, that the commission can hear any modifications or in essence grant a variance to any of the requirements. So the landscaping part is more or less a modification or a variance to going from our code saying mulch to river rock. The first one is uh, the exterior. Uh, when, when staff looked at it, it it's a, appears to be a brick if you want to say but i guess the easiest way for me to explain it is almost like a a split face cmu type block uh mm -hmm. type of thing our code says stone brick or wood and so that was again one of the concerns uh we don't really have a, a i guess a strong uh, recommendation one way or another on that uh there's pictures that have been provided in there and there's op ab this, excuse me the applicant is here and they can go over a little bit more. Uh, I know it's, uh, as they put in their app, uh, in their in the packet, it's similar to their campus at Stillwater is what they're proposing. So probably haven't said too much already. I'll leave it at that and okay. give it back to the commission. All right, is there someone here representing uh, Indian Meridian would like to speak? Okay. Well, good evening. My name is Jim Healy. I'm with Dewberry Architects. Okay. My address is 1350 South Boulder Avenue in Tulsa. And like what's been spoken so far, we're here to hopefully give some more understanding of our uh, design for the new Meridian Technology Center on South Division Street. Uh, we did provide some uh, backup information on some of the uh, design philosophy for Meridian. Um, the reasoning for the building aesthetic, it's uh, a carryover to their identity in terms of a campus uh, feel. This building structure here, it's actually two buildings. Uh, there are some Im images of the Stillwater uh, campus structures that um, were, were carrying over some of the architectural character. The, the one aspect that was commented on uh, the, main, the main material on the new campus buildings are, they're actually concrete masonry units in a full veneer type of masonry, but instead of traditionally you see a split face, these are smooth, polished uh, masonry units that give a more uh, refined, if you will, appearance than the traditional split face maybe you see on other buildings uh, in 
the Guthrie uh, area. Um, so, so our intent, like I indicated, was to carry over the architectural theme of uh, what's the identity of the structures on the Meridian campus and give a very uh, 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 higher ed type of feel to this campus with the polished, burnished block uh, concrete masonry unit. And the, the pictures, the renderings, uh, I, I actually did have a sample of the material, uh, but I did not bring that with me, but it is a polished masonry unit with, uh, it's mainly a, a beige with some uh, color components within it. So uh, that's one of the things on the application regarding the building. Okay. The other aspect of the landscaping is more, it, it, it reaches some of the goals for Meridian from an operational standpoint for maintenance and uh, upkeep generally as the life of the building proceeds, plus giving it some architectural uh, landscape character. And obviously Meridian is thinking sustainable practices with uh, the less watering, the less uh, uh, using those resources, uh, being mindful of, of that on their operational goals and budgeting. Are there any questions from the commission? What's, what's the timeline for completing this project and having it open for classes? Timeline, the project has been bid. Uh, a construction manager is, is waiting in the wings, so to speak. Permits have been filed. These permits have been filed, filed with the city. These two items were called to our attention to come and discuss them with you before release of the permit. Uh, so. We've, we've wor we're working through things with the Devar Department of Environmental Quality, with ODOT, some of the site utility type of uh, issues. Uh, all those have been resolved. And timeline for construction is to start within, I would say, 30 days. And uh, I think the timeline for construction is maybe 16 to 18 months. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. My question is, how much, as, as an architect, how much more does it, how much more would it cost you guys to put brick than it would to put um, concrete block on, on a building like that? I don't know if, if there is a difference. The uh, clay, uh, brick is obviously a clay material. This product is a, is a concrete masonry material. Um, I don't, I have not run a number on the actual cost, but they're both in terms of, uh, uh the building wall assembly construction. Mm -hmm. There it's a veneer. So you have a structural steel frame, you have a metal wall stud construction with, with sheathing, and then you have an airspace, and then you have this masonry. So I, I don't think it's really, we didn't approach it from this is less expensive or more expensive. This is probably a more expensive material than a standard red brick. And uh, so, so the main emphasis for this material in the design of the structure was to give it the Meridian identity that is consistent with their campus in Stillwater. Oh, and, you're, and you're in a city that really fights for its identity too, if, if you hadn't noticed. Yes, yes, right. so. I, I, we appreciate that. I would respectfully request that you perhaps look at maintaining the uh, identity of Indian Meridian while still maybe looking at the idea that we're trying to be the red brick city, which we have so much of it already, and how well we could maybe identify in that way also. And that, that, particular, that particular stone, it comes in red as, as well, doesn't it? Of course, you did this aesthetic. This aesthetic was based on the campus in Stillwater, I assume. That is correct. That is yeah. correct. And this, from a master planning standpoint, is uh, a building that is the, the first of this campus. And um, what the the building in Stillwater is. So you would like to replicate it? Like it's a replica of, of this. Is a replica of the one in Stillwater? Well, it's not a replica. It's this property oh, for in the property. South Division is a future. Uh, is the campus now for 
Meridian and Guthrie, and this is the first two buildings for this property. There is a master plan study that was done for future expansion throughout the property. I think, but I'm, I'm speaking for Meridian, but I think they want to be very community minded. I think if moving to a red brick or even a concrete block material would certainly be a strong divergence from their mission with that identity. Dan, do you have any suggestions or? I mean, I'm kind of lost here. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, that's kind of why staff brought it forward. I mean, the only thing I, I would maybe look at is is if they would be willing to do maybe a compromise, and I don't know if that's what the, the commission would even be looking for, where maybe on the lower portions of the building it be more of a red brick with, you know, maybe halfway up or whatever it be the, the current design. But at least it would give some, I guess, uh, impression or indication to the red brick and the red brick theme that, or maybe even painting a portion of what's going to be proposed, again, red, uh, you know, I guess, you know, again, if that's what the commission's looking for, that would maybe be my suggestion. I don't know how viable that is or if they'd be willing to do that. I, th I th if I could add to that, I think we'd, again, speaking on behalf of Meridian, I think we're, we feel very strongly about this identity and keeping the identity that we have. Um, I, I certainly appreciate your uh, emphasis and your enthusiasm for the architectural character of, of Guthrie. It's a, it's a very um, deep in heritage. Certainly understand that with the architectural background I have. Um, but with that said, I know there's, there, is other, there are other structures within the community that have slightly diverged from what you're speaking of in terms of this red brick um, um, appearance and aesthetic as being consistent through the community. Yeah, and, and, and if I can just add again, because that's, uh, I was going to say a couple things. Number one, obviously our code currently doesn't say, you know, a certain portion has to be red or, or you know, mm -hmm. has to be red brick. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess our concern was that did it meet kind of the definition of brick as it's put in our, our code? And again, maybe the brick that's in our code was meant to be red, but it doesn't say red in that. But as, as the applicant had indicated, I can say that there are, this would not be a building that is unheard of, I guess, in the community as there are similar uh, other buildings or structures with that type of appearance, so. Yeah, I guess my comments would be, first off, I appreciate um, Meridian's um, plan to move uh, to at a campus in Guthrie, I think it's gonna be a wonderful educational asset and we're very happy to have you here. And that's my, I think at the end of the day, that's the most important thing um, beyond aesthetics. However, I also would say, um, you know, with any um, company organization that has a strong identity, you know, if McDonald's wanted wanted to, they would build the same McDonald's everywhere they go and you would, and every McDonald's would look like every other McDonald's. What I appreciate is when McDonald's takes the time to go above and beyond and to create a, a unique sense of place where they are. Um, you look at the McDonald's in Bricktown in Oklahoma City and the design is very different from most that you would see and it, it makes that McDonald's special and they still have a strong brand. You know, I still recognize the arches when I see it. So uh, I would just wonder, since cost is not a, a barrier in this case, I would just wonder uh, how you might be able to, to um, to balance those tensions of sameness, as we heard about earlier, but also, um, you know, creating that unique sense of, of place, so. Again, I, I appreciate the, the enthusiasm and the, and, the, and the goals of what you're, you're looking for and to, to maintain the quality aspects of the historical architecture with the red brick and I certainly would, my own opinion, in, in, the, in the areas where you have that architecture very prominent, this campus being, I'm not gonna say remote, but somewhat down on South Division Street, it's got its own, there's no really precedent on its perimeter, there's no really driving aesthetic to, make, to maintain a context, if you will, in terms of the neighborhood 
Um, it, it has an opportunity to, uh, to create its, its identity and maintain its identity that, that is being carried over from the Stillwater campus. And again, uh, Meridian feels very strongly with this identity uh, that they've, they've established over uh, the course of what, since the 1970s. Is this, is this the same stone you're using? Are you No, uh, that's, that's more of a rough split face. Mm -hmm. What um, we're doing is a more smooth ground. It's almost a polished. So, is, a, so is, is, is this not rough? This is, this is part of what's on this building, but this is really the, the, uh, the building material we're uh, so you're, going with. So it's not, it, it's no, not. Sir. But this is part of one of your existing campuses? It is. It's a small, there's some small walls there. I wouldn't even mind seeing um, two different, see where this looks like brick right here? It may be just a facade in this yes. picture. I wouldn't mind having this. It does somewhat put you in mind of a sandstone or a, a rough type of stone. But I don't see, it, in order to make, make a compromise. It, it looks to me like we should try to work in some of the red brick and perhaps we could look at, at uh, how that appears and maybe they would not be uh, totally opposed to, to maybe a compromise, if you will. <laughs> Simply because that's, a, that's something that we've been since 1889 is nearly all of our buildings have been uh, red brick, and then some of our uh, council members in previous lives have let that go, and we are trying to recapture uh, the city of Guthrie as red brick, prairie town, early, uh, the architecture. There, there you know. uh, again, speaking for Meridian, there could be, Jeremy, um, a willingness maybe to bring in a differing texture to some of the images you see there mm -hmm. on their campus, instead of a completely polished, 100% uh, of the masonry be the polished burnished these, block. These, these others look like stone a bit. Mm -hmm. It does have a split face and it, it does represent, it the does some. That, that you're talking about, none of those will have, they will just be flat, I guess. Yes, sir. So they do deviate, they do. Yeah, but no, they're not using are we that. are we they're more concerned about the texture or the color at this point? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not as concerned about the texture as, as the color. Mm. Yeah, they're seeing the wall at the, the trades building. I mean, if it's a sandstone color, I think that would possibly be complementary. Guys, put the three pictures back up. The three uh, renderings. Because a lot of our earlier buildings. Aaron, can you blink? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Is that, that the picture you wanted? No, the, the three renderings of the tech. Oh, the renderings of the school. Further. There we, there we go. go. That That's the one? It. Yeah. Or the one from the still water. Th that oh, part that follows the split, right? All the masonry you're seeing in those images are the, the, polished, the polished, smooth face mm. uh, masonry. which we can't see. <laughs> it's hard to do. And, and the color, yeah, on my desktop computer, it looked very gray, but this looks more of a beige. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even if it was a close, close to a sandstone color, I think we, we have enough of that in the community that it would echo some of that I history. Mm -hmm. um, and even downtown, we have a lot of red brick, but not every building is red brick. Some are sandstone. Right. So. And some of them have the corners that are a little You have the def decorative mm -hmm. finials and all of that. I guess respectfully, all we're asking is, would you, would you check? Would you be willing to see if, if there could be a compromise worked out? And one option would be to in introduce maybe some texture, different texture. But I think the, the, the red is such a divgence from the campus historically but, of course but the campus material. is 40 miles away and Guthrie's right here 
How close is this, um, is your property to the Mercy Clinic? Next door. It's next door, because that is an architectural neighbor that you have. Correct. And they have, uh, what, what material do they use on most of their building? It's a darker brick, isn't it? it it's not red brick, but no. it's a... I think they're all natural colors, beige mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some browns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's definitely no red, but it is more like the earth tone, I guess, right. or natural. Darker yeah, darker than this. Yeah. yeah. Not that you have to look exactly like them, but. Um, yeah, I understand wanting to protect your brand. Um, so it's easily identifiable. Um, but I also think that it could perhaps strengthen your brand if, if, if the community appreciates it and sees it as a nod to our history and what we're uh, trying to do here as a community. I think that would and of course your sign is quite be a positive the... thing. I don't have any concerns with the landscaping. No. I think that's a smart move based on mm -hmm. sustainability practices. And I don't want to, you know, obstruct too much. Um, Joe is on the Historic Preservation Commission so he He's, he's used to be in the bad cop a little more, but. <laughs> so, Joe, do you have anything you'd like to say about that? Well, I just wish they'd give a wink to Guthrie, I guess, you know. Oh, a wink would be nice, yeah. A wink, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I don't mind the design of the building, mm -hmm. anything fine. about it, just something to, that says, you know, Guthrie Campus. I wish I had a picture of the Mercy Clinic to see just how much different. And I, I mean, I can see with uh, the blue logo, you know, a red brick in contrast with the blue logo would not work well. In my amateur graphic design uh, mind, I can see how that, there's not enough contrast between a red brick and the blue logo. But what about the sandstone, but the sandstone that yeah. might be... Um, I would be okay with that. And maybe if we saw it in person, maybe it would uh, it would look more like sandstone. I'm not sure. Because mm. this almost has a, a pinkish uh, beige color to the background here yeah. in the middle one. I mean, our, our football stadium has this similar material. I know when Walmart came here, mm -hmm. There must have been some kind of design review because it looks different than other Walmarts, but it's not red brick, so. But you know. the design is different of the building. I think the, the yeah. prior city plan. Uh -huh. uh, we, we, we do have other materials incorporated into the exterior elevations. Uh, there is a, uh, so there's some stucco. It's not EFIS, it's, it's real stucco. And we're using cast stone uh, horizontal bands of cast stone, which is a trait in a lot of your historical buildings. Uh, we're carrying through some of the blue uh, meridian color to the building, obviously, in the logo, and some splashes of that blue uh, through some of the architectural elements, and it's metal. It's a very, it's not a metal corrugated, it's a flat, decorative, high, it's got a lot of rigidity, rigidity to it. So um, the, the cast stone elements really are something that's on your, historically your buildings. Now, this is coming to us because of the material being used, not because of the color. And we don't have you know, an, a new ordinance in place that specifies red brick. Right. So on what basis could we, I mean, could we object? I mean, yeah, I guess the way we were looking at it is we wanted to make sure that it would fall into a category of the brick or what the code says, because it isn't a traditional brick outside of even color wise mm -hmm. in that. And so that was one of the main concerns we had. If you feel that it's, it's I guess, close enough or it meets the intent, uh, so to speak, of being a brick or brick material, then I think you can approve it and, and have what the current code 
and be fine. We just weren't certain at a staff level that we wanted to necessarily make that determination. So that's why we wanted to bring it to the Planning Commission mm -hmm. for obviously a little bit more review and, and more, uh, I guess, eyes on it and, and a little bit more insight in that. I mean, I, I think, you know, there probably is enough in our current code that you can approve it. As we talked about tonight in that going forward, we're definitely going to be moving in a direction to uh, kind of clean up our codes to where it's uh, more uh, obvious to anybody coming in what is expected rather than you know just having brick or whatever. So again, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. yeah. Sounds but like I, our code doesn't have a lot of teeth yet. It, no, it, yeah. it, it's true. And, and, and you know, at the same time, that's it. I mean, I guess we're, you know, we need to make a decision because we as staff need something to kind of hold on to, so to speak, from uh, you guys saying, yes, what's there is good, we can move forward or no, it's not quite, and here's what we want or expect in order to meet the code, and then we'll be able to, again, work with the uh, applicant to make sure that's taking place. My point of explaining some of the other materials on the project, a lot of thought went into not only how the, the spaces within the building, how the spaces are arranged, but the, um, the impression, again, I, I don't want to keep saying the, the Meridian um, identity, but um, really honing in on select materials, high quality materials, long lasting materials. Mm -hmm. um, it, this is a, uh, a 60 year old campus building. It's not intended to be an EFIS uh, metal building um, tire store. No disrespect to tire stores. <laughs> but uh, there has been a lot of thought in, in the ex material expression, uh, giving respect to or identity to the Meridian uh, campus that people are very familiar with, and also being very choosy on the, the composition of the materials, not introducing too many materials. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is kind of a hesitancy on my part from a design standpoint to maybe introduce a, a rougher brick in some places. Um, from the polished, uh, polished masonry that we have. Uh, do any of these materials that you're proposing come in um, darker colors? And, and I guess not gradient, but um, tone, a little darker tone. This, the tone of this material is actually has more of a brown. The pictures, the imagery may come off it a little bit light. Mm. Um, it's more of a brown with some uh, uh, burnt orange, very minor flakes, which give it some variation in color. It's not a very uh, uh, constant, consistent color, but it, it does uh, up close give a variety of color, but from maybe street, you know, from the street level, uh, street distance, it's got a, a darker brown appearance. There have been so many points made this evening and on both sides that I would, I would just like to see a, a darker emphasis placed. If, if that's possible, if we can't go the full red brick, uh, that's just my opinion. I, would, I just don't like the really light whitish look that appears in the, mm -hmm. the photographs. Any more comments? Yeah, it, it does look a, a bit institutional and mm -hmm. you are an institution, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, I think it would warm it up a, a bit, and maybe in person this material would would give that effect. And maybe but. the rougher textures that you're discussing instead of the polished. Well, my my point about the rougher texture it it introduces another material or another layer of of texture when, as I said, we're very selective on not getting too many combinations of four or five different materials. Um, I think that's just good architectural practice to have a, a staple of three, three at the most types of different materials. Yeah, that's why you don't want to use too many fonts right. in, a doc, in a document. <laughs> and form follows function. I mean, if it, would, if it would help to actually bring some of the samples for the, the color of the smooth face, um, 
to have you review those. Uh, and, and keeping that, that brown or darker, darker tan, darker uh, beige brown that you're maybe speaking about. Um, when is when is groundbreaking, or when is that supposed to be scheduled? Do you know? Don't know if there's a brown groundbreaking officially determined. Jeremy, you might know. So Jeremy's Walker, 3025 South Division Still, or no, 1312 South Sanger in Stillwater. Um, our, our board meets next Tuesday, and that was supposed to be the point when the board decides to go forward or how we go forward. Um, so from that point and then looking at September-ish as a groundbreaking mm -hmm. and then starting that 16 to 18 month build process. So really here next week is when that decision is being made uh, to move forward. Well, we definitely want you here. And to me, this appears to be kind of just a little hiccup that hopefully it can be resolved. Um, at this point, I'm not really sure. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to ask. So at this point, is the commission, I guess, okay with the type of, of material, but it's more of the color or the dark needing darker texture? Because if that's I think the case, so. we can work with them and they can bring it into us and say, here's the actual color, you know, it's going to be dark as, as the applicant mentioned. And we could probably take care of that at the staff level because that's probably a little bit more clear for us in terms of direction of what's being looked at. And that as long as, again, you're saying that the, the materials or, or what they're proposing mm -hmm. is okay, we just want it to be a little darker. We're, we, I think we're- Because I will say that, you know, as we are discussing, sometimes photos can be deceiving mm -hmm. and even what's maybe being proposed may be a little bit darker, but that aspect we could probably work with them on. Our biggest concern was whether or not that kind of material or it met a definition of stone or brick. And, and if you guys can feel, or I guess uh, feel that it does, then I think we can move forward and we'd work with them to make sure it's a little darker. Gentlemen. Yeah, I mean. Definitely, excuse me, sure. we would definitely be up for bringing that darker material and maybe staying away from adding the texture, more texture to it. We think the, the, the design philosophy of the architecture for this structure was to give it that uh, higher ed type look with the polished, it's, it's more a mm -hmm. handsome material in our opinion, mm -hmm. as opposed to the rougher material you sometimes see that's traditionally called the split face um, masonry. So again, we would be certainly willing to maybe notch that up a darker tone a little bit, mm -hmm. but stay in the, in, the, in the brown beige family. Gentlemen. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. Okay, yeah. then I propose um, a motion. Okay, I make a motion to approve. Second. Subject to staff review of yes, the color. Subject yeah. to staff right. review, yes. okay. okay. And then also if you could include that motion for the approval of River Rock versus Mulch. Yes. Is that, okay. okay. I second. Okay. Okay. So second. Um, oh, hold on. Need Joe Chapel. Yes. Carol Paget. Yes. Chris Bryant. Yes. All right, past three zero. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate your uh, willingness to, to look at that and try to darken it a little. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay let me see. I think we're... One last okay. item. Yeah, last but we not do. least. Yes. Oh. Okay, we're going to uh, number nine, discussion and clarification. I got to take a break. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take a quick break. Oh. Yeah. Quick. Okay. okay. Five minutes. Okay. Less. Yeah. Less. Less. Okay. okay. I'm going to go ahead and read this because I know Joe's read it. Uh, discussion and clarification on the application of Chapter 4, Article 3, Section 4 37, uh, Connection to Utility Systems. Staff. You know, and it, I kind of chuckled because you're probably going to get sick of me because I keep throwing all this stuff back to the Commission, but. I, I think it serves a valuable purpose in, in that when there is some issue uh, in that to bring things to the commission for clarification as well as determination or whatever the case may be. So having said that, we're, at, we're in another situation here where, as it said, this happens to do with our code in, in connection to utility systems. And 
The code section that we're referring to was in your report. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but the, the key area that we're talking about is it says a public water main or public sewer system shall be considered available to a building when the lot line is located within 300 feet of the public water or public uh, water main or sewer. The, the issue that's really come up, and there's one in particular, and actually the, the, um, a couple of the people in the audience are here to speak of that too, is on larger lots uh, in that where we're talking, you know, three, four acres, uh, the house is being built uh, substantially uh, or a distance that is substantially away from the street. In a particular case of the, um, the owners that are here, it's about 750 feet. So, uh, but the actual water connection or the, the place to connect to the water in the street is basically along the lot line. And so by a strict, I guess, interpretation of the code, they need to hook up to water uh, in that. And again, it would be about a 750 feet of, of water line that they would have to, to provide. Now, uh, for some of you that have been around here longer, you may out, but I was going to give a little history or for what I understand this ordinance or this code section came about was back in the day there was the uh, wells that were being put on properties kind of uh, hap not haphazardly but in a, a quite a significant manner. Uh, this ordinance was in place in, in essence to kind of control that or stop that to where then we would be getting connection to the infrastructure uh, that's in place. So I think the, the real intent of the code was to make sure that there was something in place to look at, review, or even analyze situations rather than just having somebody put in a well and connect to the well and, and move about. So having said that, staff would feel that the intent of the code it is uh, in some cases uh, being met in that they're not just haphazardly or just saying I want a well because I don't want to pay revenue or, or have to pay a water bill. I want to be on my own system in some cases. But we come back to where the code says, you know, 300 feet from a lot line. And so it, from our standpoint, it, it was a t it's a tough thing. Uh, I think there's a lot in there that the intent of the code is being met. Uh, my suggestion would be, depending on what you guys say, that it would be an area that, uh, again, we would need to look at the code, more specifically the council, to probably address some of that. Because I think there are situations, and I know there's been even situations where rural water has said, we don't even want to give you water. And so they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, where we're saying you have to, and even rural water saying, well, we don't necessarily want to, or we can't in that at this time. And so, and, and you know, you guys know more about the history with rural water than I do, but having said all of that, I, you know, if the commission were to say that you know, the, depending how you would look at that 300 feet, again, I think there is, is uh, I guess, value either way on how you look at it. So I'll kind of throw it back to you guys to see what your thoughts are and, and what you think, because again, I think some of it comes down to a literal black and white in, uh, reading of a code. And, and so I kind of leave it with you guys. Okay. Yeah. We uh, have someone that wants to speak on that. Is that correct? Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> well, no, you, yeah. it's concerning yeah. this. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. please. With your name and address, please. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kalkman, and I live at 908 Jupiter Road in Edmond. But we've just purchased, well, three months ago, we purchased 10 acres at 830 West Lake Road, which is just north of Guthrie Lake. Mm -hmm. And it's our intent to build our dream home there. Um, we're going to combine homes with my father, who's 91. So we're going to sell our home. He's going to sell his home. We're going to build together and be able to care for him at home for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And then our second intent is I have a grown son with brain cancer. And so he is tumor-free right now. We're three years in. 
but there's a greater than 90% chance that he's going to have a recurrence and he will have them until it gets him. So we want that suite that we're building for my father will later be the suite for my son. And we're kind of going back to nature because of my son's condition. And that's been a strong part of why we decided to come out to the country. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We're very, very careful. We got rid of all the chemicals in our home. We've done every, you know, no more air fresheners. We use tooth powder instead of toothpaste, everything. So water is a biggie for us. And one of the things that we looked at before we bought this land was the water source. And we assumed we would be on a well. And Rural Water District told us we didn't have to take rural water if we didn't want it. But then I talked to Dan and his team, and they said, yes, you do if you're within 300 feet of the line, like he explained. So this piece of land is rather unique. It's shaped like the state of Oklahoma, only backwards. So it has this little tiny panhandle that goes about 800 feet back to where it opens up and where we're going to build the home. Now that panhandle touches right where the water line is. But we would have to trench 770 feet back to the home site and, and plumb that to connect to the rural water. So rural water said, no, you don't. We've been back and forth between the two. Um, Dan's staff asked for a letter from rural water. Rural water provided a letter saying they don't have to connect. City said, yeah, but we still have this ordinance that says you do. So we're kind of betwixt and between. What we had intended to do was a well with a very strong filter purifier and everything. And um, one of the reasons that I'm a little concerned is I have read articles. I'm sure Guthrie Water is no different than most cities, but like I said, we're extremely careful. The things that he's on when he's with chemo, you know, we're, we're just very careful. And there's an article here that says, the city manager said the odor, distaste, and water discoloration, discolorization in the system is due to late turnover. People living and working in Guthrie can't get away from the funk in the city's water system. We dump out more coffee and tea than anybody should have to, said a server at Katie's Diner. Oh, it's terrible. The taste, you can smell the water, you can taste it, said Jeff Long, who I think was the man just speaking here earlier. Yeah. Um, so I'm just real concerned. We had the neighbor's water tested before we bought the piece of land. That was one of the conditions, and it tested perfectly clean. It's, uh, the parts per million are really, really low. So that was one of, our, one of our plans when we bought that piece of land. And so we're really... So, with your land, like if you built at the very back of your property, as far back as you could get away from that water, you know, how far could you have been back there? A thousand feet? Oh, more than that. Do you know, Rob? Is it twelve hundred feet? I think it's twelve hundred. So if you wanted to go back there, you'd have to put in twelve hundred feet. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not right. So. <laughs> Just <safe>. So <laughs> um, you're wanting to build a well. I mean, you wanted to we, drill. Water. We want to drill a well okay. and and have that be our water supply and put a very sophisticated filter system throughout the house, mm -hmm. so that someday when it's my son living in that special suite instead of my father. Mm -hmm we know that we've got a water supply that we're in control of. And we can have tested at any time, and you know, we can always be aware of what's going on with it. My suggestion to this, you know, uh, you know, I can see if your house is within 300 feet of the water, but not your property. You know, if you've got, mm. if you've got 10 acres and you're building at the back of the property, like you said, if you'd have to, and most, in most situations, you're going to be talking about more rural areas right. anyway. So it just seems like to me that that 300 feet should be to the home and not the property. I wonder and, if there could be a medical exception. Well, yeah, and, and I mean, in, in this case, like I said, uh, even, even the way the lot is configured, I think, has some... Um, uh, justification, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, if it were in a true uh, area of going for a variance, I think there would be uh, justification uh, because as the applicant indicated, uh, the portion of the lot line that's actually along there is a very small portion of it. And 
uh, I think the, you know, again, the intent of the code is still being met. And I also look at it as if the property line, let's say maybe 50% of a frontage property line is in that area, we can say, okay, yeah, you have to hook up. But in this case, it was a very small portion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, to be honest, before I made that determination or we made that determination, we wanted to kind of bring it to you guys to see if that's a proper line of thinking. I think down the road we can go back with the ordinance and uh, again clean it up so it's a little bit more understood mm -hmm. as to what the 300 foot means. But obviously we have a particular case and there's another one too that is in a similar situation. And so that's why you know we're bringing it to you. So Did you having all estimate what it would cost to run 750? About nine thousand eight hundred dollars. Yeah. Wow. So we're not in a variant situation. This is you're asking us to interpret the rule in a general sense, yes. right? So I can see how with with your case, there are many reasons to make you know the exception. Would this mean that if someone has a large piece of land, if they just build their house far enough back, they don't have to connect the city water, or? I well, yeah, I mean, again, it could be determined like that. In this case... Would that set a precedent of any well, kind? Well, no, and, and, and that's why I guess the way I was looking at it is if we come to kind of a clarification or determination that it also has to do with the frontage that you have on a particular property. Because the same thing, if you have, you know, let's say 1,200 feet of frontage and you happen to want to put it all the way to the back, I don't think that's as much uh, justification or, or that to say you don't have to. Also, you know, at the, in the case of this property and many topography becomes a big issue too, mm -hmm. you know, because there really isn't the ability physically to be up on that front property line in some cases. You have to put it back in order to get a viable buildable area and, found, you know, kind of mm -hmm. foundation area. And that's the thing with some of these properties, I think that's the case. And, and it may be one of those things where we look at saying, you know, a property over one acre or two acres that has some characteristics are, you know, exempt. Yeah. Because I think, you know, again, there's enough there to say, yeah, this is kind of silly, so to speak. Yeah. So if we gave you that direction, then you could uh, yes. apply that um, yes. on an administratively right. to some of these. Right. And that's what I was saying is, is to kind of get some clarification and to make sure that that line of thinking would be uh, prudent. Uh, for cases, but it would definitely not be, I, I don't believe, setting a precedent to where, you know, we no longer have anybody hooking up if they're within 300 feet. Yeah, but under these conditions, yeah. then, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And since it is, well, the, it's vague, the interpretation, should we get a letter from Rural Water and, uh, or have them get a letter? Saying that would be one of the things we would look at uh, as well as part of the determination because that was one of the things that we looked at. We did receive that, and then we were still like, eh, let's go and get a, you know, get some more, uh, again, uh, thoughts on it before we move forward. But that would be one of the minimum things we would get is if there was the willingness or, I guess, not the requirement from rural water to hook up. Yeah. Yes, we've had some significant right. difficulties in the past, yeah. and I would prefer to avoid that. Yeah, and, and that would be a that would be a mandatory. And if okay. they wouldn't want to produce that letter, then everything else is not going to. They're then they're going to be required to hook up. Period. Okay. Yeah. So. And that's kind of why we were bringing it because it was an instance where they're like, e we don't even care if you hook up or not. So it was like it made it a little bit more. Right. Well, I'd mm -hmm. yeah. Want Unique, it, I guess. It, is, I yeah. want it in writing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of motion do you need for this? Actually, what which. Uh, I don't know if I, on this you. one I necessarily need much. a motion. I, I think your clarification determination is enough. I will probably on my end be writing up a letter to have uh, that states such that's more or less an interpretation uh, of the code and, and that. So we have it for down the road so if something does come up. But I think the meeting minutes in itself okay. is enough. So for number nine, I think we just should state for the record that uh, we've turned it over to staff. Yes, thank you. Okay. I hope that's helpful to you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay uh,
comments from staff? Just real quick, I just wanted to say again that we did receive the uh, resignation from Re Renee Spinetto, and so we will have a vacancy on the Planning Commission. We will be putting it through the normal processes for advertisement, so even now if there are some public out there that are wa still watching and would like to you know, volunteer their time and, and make this city even better, uh, put in an application. Okay, thank you. Comments from the commission? Chris. Um, just thank you to city staff for all that you do. Thank you. If yeah. anybody was watching this meeting, no one will volunteer to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they'll make you the chairman. <laughs> That's all I have to add. <laughs> well, thank you all for, I guess, for making me the chairman. And You're so welcome. Uh, yes. Our yeah, we just and threw threw you, you into that you <laughs> first meeting. You did such a great job. Oh, it was a vote of confidence. <laughs> but thank you very much, okay. and I look forward to serving the city of Guthrie again as in the planning commission. It was something I have a passion for. Thank you all very much. And with that, we're adjourned. Good.